Our Father, we thank you very much for this time. We bless your name. We glorify you, Lord, because we know you are a good God. Thank you because of the things you are teaching us and revealing to us. We pray, O Lord, that these things will have definite impact upon every life in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that you'll be glorified in our lives. We pray, Lord, that all these things you are pointing out to us from church to church, the church in Ephesus, the church in Smyrna, and the church in Pagamos, and the church in Tatira, and as we come to the church of Sardis today, we are praying, Lord, that all the blemishes and the spots and the bloods and the sins and the compromises in all these other churches will not be in our church in Jesus' name. We also pray that you touch our very lives, so that every life will bring glory to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that every member of the church, every minister of the church, everyone in the church, the church together, will glorify you, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you reveal your mind and your truth to us now. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a better amen. Uh, you know that I don't like my congregation going to sleep while I'm sweating and shouting here. Yeah? I didn't tell you to sit down and look at you. Praise the Lord. Have your commitment and read after me. My commitment. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die is cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living. Sight walking. Small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have time to be right. First, top, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. And I'll live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk by patience. I live by prayer and labor by power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way wrong, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be detoured. I cannot be lured away. I cannot be turned back. I cannot be deluded. I cannot be delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of the adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder at the pool of popularity. I will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up. Until I've stayed up. Stood up, prayed up paid up and preached up the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes. I must give until I draw. I must preach until all know. And walk until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, I will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. 
Amen. You can be seated. We're looking at another church today in a Bible teaching. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3. And I'm reading to you from verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, from verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things, says he, that has the seven spirits of God, and seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou livest, and art dead. Here we come to the challenge of reviving a dead church. Can you see the church here? As Christ introduced himself. Obviously, as Christ evaluated the church, they must have been surprised. Why? Because Christ's evaluation of this church is so different from their own evaluation of themselves or the evaluation of the world around them. You see, most Christians and even most churches, they are full of self-praise for themselves. They publicize their own praise. And they sing their own praise before other churches. And they do that in the media as well. And the media tries to tell some good, good things about these churches. But do you know that the evaluation of Christ is different from the evaluation of the media? And the evaluation of Christ is different from your own evaluation of yourself. And the evaluation of Christ is very much different from the evaluation of your superintendents and overseers and leaders and the people that are commending and praising you. Actually, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6, most men will proclaim everyone is on goodness, but this is unwise. And it can be very deceptive. Self-praise comes out of unrealistic comparison with other people. Out of false comparison from a proud heart. The heart is proud. And the heart is saying, nobody has a better church than ours. And the proud heart is saying, we've made it, we've done it. This is great and this is wonderful. And then Jesus comes and blows the balloon punctures their balloon. And then the self-praise cannot hold any water anymore. They, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12. This wrong attitude will result in self-satisfaction when you think you're all right. You're doing it well. You're making the way you ought to make it. Everything is all right when everything is all wrong. When you think like that about yourself and about your church and about your fellowship and about your ministry and about the people around you, about the section of the work you're doing, you think there is no more room for improvement because there is self-satisfaction and there is complacency. And that can make us blind to reality until we blindly plunge ourselves into eternal destruction, eternal darkness, eternal damnation, eternal perdition. The church in Sardis had a name of being alive. The people around said it was a lively church. It was a dynamic church. The church had a good reputation. The world around. And all who did, who did not see were the eyes of Christ. They did not see any sign of spiritual sickness or even spiritual death. We must not let the praise of men deceive us into thinking that we are praiseworthy. Because other seasons that were spiritually alive, self-praise or the praise of men are equally deceptive. When you praise yourself, when you congratulate yourself, and when you see your friend and you say, well, you know, we made it. It was a great thing. It was a wonderful thing. And I even see this kind of worldly thing coming to our church. Self praise and the praise of other people. I remembered when we finished, um, say, 2002. And I could, you don't know that I know, but I know. And I could see some people going to the National 
um, leader of the youth of the young people shaking hands with him and he was saying congrats you made it I passed by and shook my head we don't need that praise of man we don't need that congratulation from man and I could see people going to one another we did it it was great we did it at this time we made it don't say that you will never know how Christ evaluates your church you will never know how Christ evaluates your ministry you will never know how Christ evaluates what you are doing until you get up yonder have a low profile and be very humble and lowly and whatever you have done Leave the evaluation in the hand of the Almighty God. And all this worldly thing that is coming on, praising one another, congratulating one another, lifting up one another, exalting one another, you made it, you got it. In fact, this time, perfect. Forget it. Let's wait for the evaluation of the Lord Jesus Christ. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commended. Generally, the world condemns those whom the Lord commends. And the world commends those whom the Lord condemns. You will know that the evaluation of the Lord is not the same as the evaluation of the world. Neither the blame nor the praise of men should be taken seriously by any of us. We're looking at this church. And we're looking at three points in the message. Number one, deception and deterioration in a dead church. Deception and deterioration in a dead church. Number two, divine directives to a dying church. Divine directives to a dying church. Number three, divine declaration to devoted Christians. Divine declaration to devoted Christians. Number one. I come to this. Number one. It talks about deception and deterioration in a dead church. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Again. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, This thing says he that has seven spirits, the seven spirits of God. And the seven stars, let's stop there for a moment. You know that Jesus Christ, in talking to these churches, always introduced himself. And he introduced himself with the kind of credential and title that will be relevant to the condition of that church. And here Jesus Christ said that he was the one having seven spirits of God. He said, but I thought the Holy Spirit is one. You are right. As you look at the book of Revelation, you'll find that seven comes up over and over and over again. Because seven there is not just the literal number. It's representing completeness and perfection, entirety, totality, finality. And so he's saying, I have the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit has perfect power. He has complete power. He has total power. And then the only way you can represent him as a perfect one, the only way you can represent him as a final, total one, no other power outside him is by the number seven. And he's talking about the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit of God. And then he says, the seven stars. By now you understand, those stars, they mean the leaders, the heads of the church, the servants, of the church, the angels of the church, ministers of the church. Then he says, I know your works. I know your works. When he says, I know your works, already he has said that he has the perfect spirit, the Holy Spirit, and it's the spirit that searches all things, yea, the deep things of God, so that as he has the fullness of the spirit, then he knows all things, hidden things, deep things, in the church completely and perfectly. He knows all things concerning the seven churches. All things about all the leaders of all the churches. Would you know then that he knows your works? He knows your activities? He knows the things you are involved with. And he knows how faithful you are in ministry. And he knows 
the superficial. And then the deep mysteries, the things that are hidden that other people cannot see. What did he say about the church? I know thy words, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Here the Lord Jesus Christ reveals something serious about this church. The members of that church, they didn't know themselves as much as Christ knew them. And I say the same thing about you, that you don't know yourself as much as Christ knows you. They profess that they have true spiritual life because they are the name that they lived. But then they were spiritually dead. And look at some in the Bible days that Jesus even spoke about and the New Testament spoke about in Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, having a name that you live and yet you are dead. A church having a name, a name that is alive and yet it's dead. In Matthew chapter 23, reading from verse 27. Matthew 23, verse 27. Who unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? For ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, and but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Uh, can you see the evaluation of the Lord Jesus Christ here? On the one hand, he knew the outward righteousness, outward uprightness, outward steadfastness, and the praise of the people, because even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men and they could deceive their church members they could deceive those who came to the synagogue because they appeared righteous it was it was like everything was okay well then jesus said here is the real truth for those who have spiritual eyes penetrating eyes like a flame of fire and for the person that has the holy spirit in its fullness and he can see what the natural people cannot see. You're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And we're told in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 6. Romans 8, verse 6. But to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Can I tell you something today? There is worldliness on the one hand, there is carnality on the other hand. And there are people that will show themselves as Christians because, see, there is no worldliness. What they are telling us to see, they are telling us to see outside, outward things. Your dressing, your appearance, and there's no jewelry, there is no farming, and all. You say, I'm free. I'm free from worldliness. But you know, are you free from carnality? Because when you are talking about carnality, that's not just the outward part now, it's on the inside. And it says to be carnally minded, to have a mind that translates into carnality. It says that is death. And they are not people that are professing they are born again. The children of God. They have the life of God in them. And there is no worldliness. See me. I'm born again, and I'm a deep alive member. And then God says, but to be carnally minded is death. If carnality is in the mind, if carnality is in the thought, if carnality is in the inward motive and disposition, that carnality translates into spiritual death. It says in verse 7, because the carnal mind. You see, here is mind, mind. Carnality is in the mind. The worldliness you are talking about, you don't look like the world, that's outward. You don't dress like the world, that's outward. And when we look at you, we say, what a wonderful brother, what a wonderful sister. See the way I handled my wedding, there is no worldliness there. I bought your mind. Because to be carnally minded is death. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be so then. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. 
You see, there were people that were pressing themselves. They thought they were alive in Christ, alive spiritually. But then when the Lord evaluated them, they were nowhere to be found. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 21. We're talking about a church thinking that that church was alive, but the church was dead. In Proverbs chapter 21, I'm reading to you from verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The man that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. I had a, a shocking, surprising, would I say testimony or just... Well, I, I don't want to call it report because it wasn't report and it wasn't testimony either. Let me just tell you. In one deeper life uh, Bible church location, the uh, people there, they saw that the prayer system in that church was changing. And then their pastor will tell them to rise up. And then he'll tell them to close their eyes. They'll close their eyes, repeat after me, and then they will repeat. And they saw that this, uh, this uh, kind of prayer was not following the pattern of the Word of God. Because the Bible is your prayer book. Did you, don't, don't you see, every morning when we come here, our leaders will read a passage of Scripture. Out of that passage of scripture, they bring some prayer items out because the Bible is our prayer book. And then eventually, while he was leading them like that, he would uh, say, say this after me. All our enemies, let them die. All these, and then they, will, then they saw that one of the sisters there uh, was uh, wondering, is this of God? And so... This uh, particular time, the sister sat near the front. And then the pastor came, as usual, deeper life pastor, and said, Stand up, everybody. We're going to pray today. Close your eyes and repeat after me. And this sister, because she wanted to find out what's going on here, she opened her eyes. And then the pastor kept on reading. And then the sister discovered, Ah, is she is reading it out of a particular book. And then the sister uh, tried to jot down some of those things and started searching, looking for this kind of book. And then eventually they discovered that kind of book, some of the members of the church, and they saw that the book was coming from an occultic, a kind of a place where you, the pastor himself will not like to mention to them, himself. Then they discovered, see, see our pastor, that is leading us. He has wandered away from the path of understanding. And even though he's still staying on the church pulpit, it says he will remain in the congregation of the dead. That's why we need to be careful. Because there are people that think they are alive. And they're very dynamic. And they're very active. And yet, they have wandered away. And now the Lord says, although you have a name that you live, but you are dead. Then in Jude... Verse 11, verse to verse 13. Jude, somebody there said, Pastor, you didn't mention the chapter. I catch you. You don't understand how many chapters a Jude has. Those of you that know, just follow me. Jude, verse 11. How many chapters do we have in Jude, by the way? Help me tell them. Only one. In Jude, verse 11, it says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain sin of Corey. There are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds there without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruits withered. Listen to this without fruit, twice dead. Plucked up by the roots. When it says twice dead, what does that mean? They were dead before they were born again. Dead in sins and trespasses. Then they became born again. After they became born again, they lost spiritual life. They became dead again. Twice dead. Then in verse 13, raging waves of the sea. Forming out their own shame. Wandering stars. 
doom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever uh, can you see here there are people that will think they are still alive and then but they are dead in the sight of the lord and uh, look at the whole church now in first timothy chapter five first timothy chapter five i'm reading to you from verse six but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And sometimes you'll find uh, the pastor of a church, the leader of a church. And this leader of the church will be encouraging worldly pleasure, worldly ceremony, worldly functions. And you will see it in the way they do everything, the way they comport themselves. And that uh, pastor will be saying, in our church here, yes, we're still deep alive. But we don't want to be a kind of deeper life where we cannot attract the rich people and the educated people and the highly placed people and the politicians and even the chiefs and the kings and uh, what, what have they, the obese and the, and the urbans or whatever they are. We want them to be able to come to our church and eventually they'll be changing things and they'll be encouraging the men and the women to follow the pleasures of the world. And here it says, she that liveth in pleasure, I'm sure you understand when it says she, if a man is also doing that, she is the same thing. He or she that lives in pleasure, she is dead or is dead while he or she liveth. That means then, if you bring into the church all the pleasures of the world, all the functions of the world, all the dancing and drumming in the world, and the people who have uh, whatever time uh, one of our preachers was preaching uh, yesterday and uh, mentioned that when you are taking the lord's supper if you bring uh, this and that well that may be for love feast that's not the lord's supper if i have time i'll question that preacher i would say are you encouraging us to be feasting have Lord's Supper apart and also have love feast apart and come together, shake hands, embrace one another, love feast, this feasting, this pleasure time, this play time, this ceremony time. Let's mark everything we say when we preach. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That's the reason we need to understand that. When a church is given to the pleasures and the ceremonies and the rites of the world, spiritual death will be coming in. When the emphasis is no more on being born again, the emphasis is no more on that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The emphasis is getting relaxed and the emphasis is, you know, living in pleasure. The emphasis is take care of yourself. The emphasis is eating and drinking. That church may think that it's alive, but that church is dead. Let's look at Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, reading from verse 13 and verse 24. Luke 15, 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. Verse 24. Remember what happened there, riotous living. Riotous living. In verse 24, for this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Here we understand, when we're given to riotous living, when you get to a church, and uh, the way, the commotion there, the, riot, the disorderliness there, you don't know whether they're fighting or whatever, and then you ask people, you say, are they fighting? Why are they like that? Why are they bullying on one another, shouting on one another? Why does it look as if there's riot over there? And they tell you, oh no, they are not fighting. That's their style. That's their comportment. That's the way they manage themselves. That actually, that in that community, the tribe in that community, that's how they are forceful. That's how they are violent. And that's how they talk to one another. If you go into the town, get into the market, the nature, the culture in that place is that of rioting. And so it also spills into the church. And sometimes to you, the culture in a particular community is just having pleasure, 
immorality, prostitutes, women, polygamy, and sometimes that spills into a church, and the life of that church is gone. And what you have there is spiritual death. Let's look at this now. Uh, what did Jesus say? You have a name that you live, but you are dead, spiritually dead. In First John, First John chapter 3, verse 14 and verse 15, we know that we are passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Look up here. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And you know that in a church, death can come in in this way. For example, in this uh, retreat, or sorry, in this uh, congress, I've been having the choir ministering every time. And I've been listening to their music. It's always good. But this one, I just happen to enjoy this one much, much more. Although they always sing well. And once in a while, I might say, praise the Lord Orchestra. Give it to me again. That is beautiful. Or sometimes when they are singing, if it's something I like very much, those who are here can see me, will say, I'm conducting from the back here and shaking my head and singing with them. Awake, 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 because I'm put on that strength. I'm just happy. And then, I, you know, when I praise them like that, you know, the ushers are as good as they are. The ushers are as beautiful as they are. And the ushers are as hardworking as they are. But, you know, I don't happen to mention those ushers. Jealousy can come in. Is it only the choir that is good? Is it only the choir that is doing well? Is it only the choir that is sacrificing? I about us here, and then, if we're not careful, the people who are working as hard as them, as faithful as them, they may become jealous, and then they may see members of the choir, or our choir master, and ah, you are, you are the pastor's uh, son now, you are the pastor's people now, you are the only one he sees now, he enjoys your ministry now. If we're not careful, Jealousy and hatred may come in from this section to this section. Both section, uh, sections are equally good. Both sections, they are working well. Only that not everyone will come to the stage over here. Over there where you are doing your work, God knows that you are faithful and that you are doing well. And those who have the chance to come on the platform, God also knows they are doing their best. Let's leave the commendation unto the Lord. And so, we'll not be jealous of one another. The jealousy can bring the hatred that this section will feel that this section is more favored. And then, that rivalry and jealousy will bring hatred. And then it says here, He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And your brother has not offended you. The only offense, so to say, is that he happens to be in the choir. And because the choir happens to be shining at that time, that's the only crime that brother has committed. That's the reason we need to be careful and not hate one another. If uh, my brother is being praised, let's rejoice for that. If my sister is doing well and we happen to comment, let's just rejoice together. It says in verse 15, Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And you understand then what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying to that church. And what were the things that could bring death in a church? Number one, self-righteousness and self-satisfaction. When we are self-righteous and we are self-satisfied and we feel that now we've made it and then there is no room for improvement anymore, spiritual death can come. Number two, carnality and fleshly lusts. Carnality and fleshly lust. When we permit, we allow in our midst fleshly lust between men and women, between boys and girls, and we don't check or control anything anymore, spiritual death will come. Number three, interaction of dead, worldly churches. We begin to flock into those deadly churches, and we begin to bring in their practices and their ideas that can cause spiritual death. Number four, neglect of the watch of life. It is this word that brings life in a church. Because it says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But when we relegate that word of life, 
that has resurrection power. We relegate you to the background, then spiritual death can come. Number five, disregarding the spirit of life. Because it is the spirit of God that quickens us, makes us to remain alive. So if we disregard that spirit of life, spiritual death may come. Number six, unconfessed sin and undisciplined backsliders. When people backslide in the church and when they will not confess their sins and turn away from them and we just leave them there and backsliding is multiplying and uh, sin is flowing in like a mighty river. That can cause spiritual death in the church. Number seven, worldliness and worldly pleasure. Worldliness and worldly pleasure. Number eight, unequal yoke and friendship with the world. That's why our young people, single people, you have not married yet, and you want to get married, please, when we are warning you, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I've seen that lady in that church. I've seen that lady in that church. Yes, we know that church is not preaching being born again, but this woman herself is a very good woman. Be very careful. Then number nine, seeking to win the world without feeding the church. Seeking to win the world without feeding the church. There are some pastors, they want large number. And therefore, they will not spend time and feed the church of the living God. All the programs they have will be evangelistic programs. Distributing Bibles, distributing food. Let's bring the people in. Let's entertain them. Let's have concert. Because it's concert that will bring all these outsiders in. And let's do something that the outsiders will come. I want this church building to be filled to capacity before the end of this year. All those religious activities seeking to win the world without feeding the church will make the church dead eventually. Number 10, perpetual insensitivity to Christ's correction. Perpetual insensitivity to Christ's correction. When the Lord is correcting the church, put this one right. Rediscover your first love. Come back to the altar again. Do your first works again. And we're insensitive to the correction of Christ. That can bring spiritual death eventually. Number 11, allowing persecution. Ridicule to uproot us from a solid foundation. Allowing persecution and ridicule to approach us from a solid foundation. For example, you're in a place of work. In that place of work, they have a lunch hour fellowship. And in the lunch hour fellowship, they will give people that don't know the word of God, they will give them chance to share with the people. And they have a roster. In the roster they have, they will bring somebody that will just talk on, on non-essentials. I will just say this and say this, make the people clap, make the people happy, and then it's over. Another one will come in the other time and say whatever they want to say. Then you go to the leadership there and say, well, I'm a Christian also, I think you know me. Oh, yes, we know you. We know you are deeper. And because we know who you are, we're sorry, we cannot give you a chance. Because if we give you a chance, you are going to make these people feel that they are not Christians. We are very, very sorry. As they discriminate like that. And then every time the pressure is on you, if you are not careful, that ridicule, that reproach, and the persecution cannot put you from your solid conviction and solid foundation. Number 12, continually taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. Continually taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. I went to a church, a deeper life a church, and uh, that Sunday morning I I was to preach, and they happened to have arranged that they were going to have the Lord's Supper. And so they started serving the Lord's Supper. While they were serving the Lord's Supper, I moved around the church and saw everything happening. And as I saw the way they were, when those who were serving the Lord's Supper, when they brought the elements to me, I said, I'm sorry, go ahead, I won't take. Because I couldn't get myself united with those people and take the Lord's Supper with them. They call themselves Deeper Life. They call themselves uh, a church under my leadership, but not in our country and another country. I said, I'll talk to you people later. Keep on, do whatever you want to do. I cannot take that Lord's Supper with you. 
When I came to preach to them, I told them the reason why. Let's see the life of Christ in this church. Let's see holiness upheld in this church. Let's see that we're standing on the unchanging word of God in this church. And that's the reason why you want to understand. Don't kill your church and kill your people. You see that the people are not living right. And you see that the people are not obedient to the word of God. And then you're just giving them the Lord's Supper, giving them the Lord's Supper. And many people, they are taking the Lord's Supper unworthily with rebellion in their heart, with disobedience in their lives. Or something you can see very visible. They are not living according to the word of God. Why don't you suspend that Lord's Supper for now and teach the people what it means to be born again, what it means to have Bible conviction, Bible-based conviction. And when we know they are living right and we know that we can honor Christ, we're honoring Christ in the office. We're honoring Christ in the home. We're honoring Christ in our families. We're honoring Christ in our personal lives. If we're honoring Christ and we're showing that we're born again, out in the world, then we come to the church and we honor Christ and we take the Lord's Supper. That will be a wonderful fellowship that Jesus himself will recognize and appreciate. I come to point number two. Divine directives to a dying church. Divine directives to a dying church. We come to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Be watchful and strengthen those things, the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Here are the divine directives. That is the commandment, the instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ gave to this church. When it says, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die. Be watchful. Now, we as preachers, pastors, leaders, our messages should follow the condition of the people in the church. Uh, don't you see the message of Jesus Christ to each of these churches? Don't you see that the messages are different? Don't you see that the messages are tailored to the spiritual condition and spiritual need of each of the churches? Don't you see that when Jesus gave encouragement, it was an encouragement that was in line with the life of that church, the condition of that church? Do you know there are some pastors and preachers, they do not look at the condition of the church. They just fire on. They just choose their text. They say, I'm led by the Spirit of God. Maybe they were having quiet time. And a particular verse of scripture, a particular message, a passage, ministered to them. And then as it ministered to them, they began to get some ideas. They said, this will be good for Sunday. This will be good for worship. This will be good for the message on Sunday. And that message has nothing to do with the spiritual condition of that church or the spiritual climate in that church. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ, he looked at the condition of his church. And then he gave them a message appropriate to the condition of the church. So he said, be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. And sometimes too. Here is where we make a lot of mistakes. Uh, sometimes uh, we see that the church in Smyrna, that church is doing well. And a pastor there seems to be, he seems to be making it. He knows what to do. Then we say, because pastor, the pastor from the church in Smyrna, uh, you are doing something wonderfully well there. I, I need you. Come and help me wake up my church, arouse my church. And then the pastor that is coming from Smyrna, will take some of his best messages and come to the church in Sardis. And the best messages that he had preached in the church in Smyrna, he brings it to the church in Sardis. And those messages are not appropriate. They are okay for Smyrna because of the spiritual condition of Smyrna. They are not appropriate. They are not all right for Sardis because it's a different church. And because it doesn't have spiritual life. And that's why you'll find when I go, I go from church to church. 
even in deeper life, from country to country. When I get to the country, I don't just take the messages I've been preaching in Lagos and uh, then just give it to the people. Uh, right now, uh, I want to preach a series of messages. And those series of messages, I already preached them in Lagos here at the headquarters. But then the people I went to preach to, uh, there were people that have just, you know, either they're just coming to know the Lord, or some of them, they do not know the Lord. Although they come from the same passage, they come from the same text of the Bible. And then somebody said, they asked me a question, why do you have to spend all this time coming to this place and treating these series of messages? Don't you have these messages on cassettes already? Because I happen to know that these passages you have dealt with them before. Why can't you just send those cassettes to them? I said, no, I cannot. Because, you see, in the Lagos Church here, I've been here since 1973. And then August this year would mean about 30 years. And I've been preaching to these people. When you are a, a professor lecturing at the university, and you are lecturing these students at the university graduate level or whatever, and then you go to a primary school, and you take the same note of lesson, and then you want to preach to the primary school people, you can't do that. It's not appropriate. That's why I'm putting it to you who are leaders and preachers and pastors. Know the congregation. Know the spiritual condition of the congregation. And then give the message to them as it is appropriate. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. Know the condition of your church. Study that church and see what their spiritual level is and then give them a message that is appropriate to them that will bring them from death back to life. Proverbs 27, verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy heart. That is your own congregation in particular. Understand their spiritual level. Understand what they need and then feed them appropriately. In Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading to you from verse 42. Watch thou... For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered permitted his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. The Lord has given us responsibility, and he has given us this responsibility so that we can minister to the congregation he has given us. And you see, sometimes uh, there are some people that do not understand that uh, the Lord is going to reward you for doing what he appointed you to do. He's not going to reward you for doing what he has not appointed you to do. And sometimes I find some of our leaders, some of our preachers, uh, their own house is burning. And I happen to know the condition of some of their churches. And then their friends and colleagues, they're inviting them, come and preach here, come and preach here, come and preach there. They're trying to build other people's houses for them. And they're not building their own house. I will repeat, we were receiving reports from their own local churches that their churches are not taken care of. Their churches are not well fed with the word of God. Their churches are not growing. They are not developing. And these same pastors will be getting invitation. Invitation from here, invitation from here, invitation from there. And they, they look like good, good people, good ministers, effective ministers. When they go to those churches, because they take four of their best sermons that they have been preaching since they started preaching, and they put them in the suitcase. And then they neglect their own local church. Their own local church is starving and dying of the lack of spiritual food. And then they take the best of their sermons and preach everywhere, and people are claiming them as great preachers but their own local churches are dying. 
And the Lord is going to ask you, what have you done for the work I committed into your hand? That's the reason we need to be careful and do the work he has given us to do. He tells us in verse 4 to say, Blessed is that servant whom when his Lord cometh shall find to him. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over his, his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink of the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come. In a day when he looketh not for him, and then it says, and in an hour that is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him, servant of God, appoint him, somebody that had been committed, something has been committed into his hands. Obviously, he was born again. Obviously, he was a child of God. Obviously, he was appointed by the Lord. You see it in the text. But now, because he didn't do his work. So as to feed the congregation that God put him over and bring them to life again, he will appoint him his portion of the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's the reason why that you as a child of God, you need to concentrate on the work the Lord had given you. And if you come back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Uh, uh, there are times uh, here, my brothers and sisters, please look up, that um, we have uh, a missionary son. Don't misunderstand me. They're doing great, great, great work. But sometimes, uh, uh, just going around the compound at the IBTC here, I may see a missionary. And I say, ah, when did you come to town? And I didn't know about it. Oh, I came about two weeks ago. What's the problem? Well, I've not seen my people for some time, and I felt that I needed to come. And also, I think that I need some care because uh, health-wise, I need some time. I said, okay, that's all right. Pray very well and rest and go back in time. Your people are, by the way, who, are, who is taking care of the work over there on the mission field? Oh, well, we don't have too many people, but um, uh, there is one new combat. He's very dynamic and very zealous, and I'm sure that, you know, he'll be able to do something before I get back. And eventually, three weeks after, just going around the compound, I, I see the same missionary again. I say, ah, my brother, you have not returned. I'm still, I'm planning to return. I about the congregation over there, the work the Lord has given you to do. What are you doing about that? Well, I'm phoning them. You're phoning them? Well, phone, do it. Just talking five minutes on the phone to the congregation, uh, to the person you put in chat there. Well, that do the work. Well, please go back in time. Don't let those uh, people scatter. And then eventually, one week after, I'm still going, and I say, ah, brother, you have not gone. I'm expecting, I'm, I want to get something from the missions uh, committee. Six weeks to two months, the fellow may be here. And eventually, when they go back, and if they have chance to talk to me, this is what they tell me. They say, before I got back, some of the people, they have scattered. I have to start all over again. I, was, I told you now. I told you now. Why don't you stay where God has put you? And endure whatever is there. And see that you do your work, because he says, be watchful. And strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die. He says, because I have not found your works perfect before God. And that's the reason why we need to remember the call of God upon ourselves. And we need to remember what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to be watchful. He wants us to be alert. He wants us to be vigilant. He wants us to take note of the signs and the state of spiritual sickness, which may result in spiritual death if not taken care of promptly and appropriately. The pastor in this church was called upon to strengthen those things which remain. You understand that? Strengthen the things which remain. And look up here, brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes we have a, you have a congregation. Let's say your membership, you have a congregation of 200 people. A false prophet comes to town. And these false prophets, as they came to town, some people were deceived. And you had five members in your church that went astray. You have 195 people that are left there. Five people went away. They've gone to join the false prophet. And then the pastor comes to church on Sunday. 
and he can he doesn't have anything for the 195 sitting down all he's preaching is preaching to the people that are absent all these people that went away you see what they have done they have gone astray they are backsliding all those people that have gone into false doctrine you people that are waiting they are your friends don't you remember don't you know them we labored on them the people is preaching to five people outside and the 195 people remaining, he, will, he doesn't have any word for them. He will not feed them. He will not help them. The Lord said, the ones that remain, strengthen the people that remain, that are ready to die, strengthen them with love, strengthen them with warm affection, strengthen them with inspiring exhortation, strengthen them with encouragement, give them the promises of God, at least they are faithful. They are still there. And they have not gone away with the five people that went. Show love to the people that are still there endeavoring to minister to that dying church in the power of the quickening spirit. Because the Lord said, I have not found thy work perfect before God. This revelation should stir us up to seek more grace, to work and to serve the Lord acceptably. And then the Lord said, remember remember we shouldn't have short memory it's telling us remember the good old days how you received and how you heard and then re rediscover that good thing the lord had given to you and then it says that you will now hold fast and you'll repent if you have begun to compromise if you have begun to let down the standard if you have begun to neglect the people of God, and you are not feeding them the word, or the word of life, repent. Repentance is turning away from everything that can cause spiritual death, and embracing life, and practical holiness in Christ. This is what the Lord has demanded, because lack of repentance will attract divine wrath and severe judgment from the Lord. And also you'll be warning your people. Sometimes uh, some of our people uh, are self-confident, just like uh, Peter. Very self-confident. Look at this. In Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Reading from verse 31. Luke 22. Verse 31. It says in verse 31, Jesus Christ talking to Peter. And as the Lord was talking to Peter, here is what he said. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And you know, something encourages me in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He looked at his people and he spent time with them. And do you know that the last week, we we'll call it the Passion Week, before Jesus went to the cross, he, just, he, he stopped outside ministry, healing the sick, gathering crowds together, feeding thousands of people. He stayed with his inner circle disciples and was training them and teaching them and talking to them and encouraging them. And then when Jesus rose from the dead, all those 40 days he spent on earth after his resurrection. What do you think? Don't you think that if he had gone to the Pharisees and he had shown them the nail prints on his hand and had said, look at this, you killed me, but I'm alive again. Don't you think that would have done something? Then they will know that the crucifixion was nothing because now I'm risen from the dead. Jesus didn't do that. Don't you think he should have gone to Caiaphas and said, Caiaphas, high priest, see, see yourself. You crucified me. I'm alive now. See the evidence. I'm alive. Jesus did not bother to go to all those people. What did Jesus do? Jesus appeared to his own disciples. They were discouraged. And they were disheartened. And they were losing their vision. I go a fishing. He knew they were by the sea. And he knew they were fishing. They have gone back to take their old trade. He went there to see them. He is strengthening the people that remain. That's the challenge the Lord is giving us. He said, that's what I did. And that is what you have to do. Let's look at our congregation. 
and forget you, you don't always be talking to the people that you know they are backsliding they are not doing well they are not doing well those people are very few but the people that are saying pastor we are waiting feed us with the bread of life give us encouragement give us faith and give us give us the work to do we want to serve the lord speak to those people rather than you're always speaking to the minority that are not doing well strengthen the things that remain we will do it in jesus name i come to point number three in point number three we're looking at divine declaration to devoted christians revelation now revelation chapter three and i'm reading to you from verse four it says thou hast a few names even in sadis which have not defiled their garments they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then he says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We have ears to hear, we are going to hear. I said we are going to hear. In that dying church where the spiritual life was declining, there were still a few believers who had not defiled themselves. It was a great challenge to remain in such a church since there was no other church in the city. But they kept themselves free from the general contamination. They maintained holiness and purity in the midst of simple backsliding people. And they kept their garments, their robe of righteousness clean and white, unsoiled with all the worldly fields around them. I believe that if these people that Jesus commended in the church in Sardis, when many other people had lost their spiritual life, they were still standing. If God gave them grace to stand, you can stand. And you will stand. This should be a challenge to us that Jesus Christ said, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, they have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy. They were walking worthy of the vocation where we, the Lord, had called them. And they were counted worthy to escape all sin that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And now the Lord gave them a wonderful promise. Wonderful promise. Here is the promise. He that overcomes, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. He that overcomes. That's what the Lord is expecting, that you will overcome. And you see, as somebody said, you've heard it from me before to you, that how do you eat a big elephant? The way you eat a big elephant is a bite at a time. You cut the elephant into pieces, and then just a bit at a time, and eventually you will finish that elephant. And guess what happens when you finish an elephant? You might be as big as an elephant yourself. Now, how do you overcome the great problems and challenges of life? You don't look at the problem and say, it's too big, I cannot overcome. Just overcome a moment at a time, an hour at a time, a day at a time. When you face the challenges of today, and you face those challenges a bit at a time, a bit at a time, that's how you become an overcomer, you will overcome. Whosoever overcomes the temptations of this present evil world, whosoever overcomes the love of the world, and overcomes the lust of the flesh, and overcomes the lust of the eyes, and overcomes the pride of life, will be found in God's book of life on that final day. I pray your name will remain there. It's infinitely better, and it's an eternally higher honor to have our names remain in the book of, in the book of life than in the book of splendid catalog of princes and poets and warriors and scientists and nobles and statesmen that the world has produced. Blessed are those overcomers whose names remain in heaven in the book of life. And the Lord said, yes, he will give us wonderful, wonderful things. One, he'll have fellowship with us. His presence will be with us. His power will be with us. And then, eventually, when Christ will come, will be with the Lord forever and ever. He says, if you will not deny him today, in the time of temptation, in the time of your trial, in the time of all your troubles, if you will not deny him today, then in the presence of the Father, in the presence of the angels of God, the Lord will confess you. The Lord will say, yes, I know him. It's one of my people. Yes, I know her. She's one of my people. I pray that when that day comes, the Lord will confess you. 
before the Father and before his angels. And you will not be ashamed on that final day in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and tell the Lord. We don't want him to deny us on that final day. That, that's the day that matters. That's the day that matters. We want the Lord, the Lord himself, to confess us before the Father. Keep your robe white. Keep your robe white. Keep it clean. Don't allow the superficial things of the day, the superficial things around you, to hinder you from being your best for the Lord and from being what you ought to do. Give yourself fully unto the Lord. Pastor, how lively is your church before the Lord? Are there people that are experiencing spiritual death but they're still in the congregation. What are you doing for them? How are you ministering to them? Are you giving appropriate message, appropriate ministration to the people that the Lord has made you overseer, has made you pastor, has made you shepherd over? Are you helping them to retain that spiritual life? Or if they're backsliding but they're still in the congregation, are you helping them to come back fully to the Lord? Why are you spending all your time, all your energy, throwing stones at the people that have left? And the people that are still remaining there, you will not feed them with the word of God. You have a name that you live, but you are dead. Does the church congregation have a name that is alive and yet is dead? The evaluation of Christ matters a lot. Are you thinking that you yourself, you are alive when Jesus is giving a separate, a different evaluation about you? You know, it's the evaluation of Jesus Christ that matters. The praise of man. Your high evaluation of yourself will mean nothing on the final day. It's whom the Lord commends that is really, truly commendable. The Lord says, be watchful, be vigilant. Watchful over your own congregation. Are you the preacher that is jumping about? from one church to another. And you will not take care of the congregation over the which the Holy Ghost has made you an overseer, has made you a pastor, a father. And instead of doing the work the Lord has given you to do, just hopping about from this place to that place, from this place to that place, and the congregation that really should have your direct ministry. They are starving spiritually. They are getting dead spiritually. Uh, you need to remember how you received and watch and repent before the Lord. Bring yourself before the Lord. As the Lord is evaluating your life and evaluating your ministry, how does the Lord do that? What does the Lord say about you? Are you in spiritual death because of jealousy? Because of envy? And because of the hatred of other people that you think are more appreciated than yourself? Come back to life. Come back to life. Spend much time on the ministry the Lord has committed into your hands. Let the Lord give you a new understanding concerning the responsibility you have. It's your robe of righteousness is pure and white. Are you still keeping and holding on to that holiness without, no, without which no man shall see the Lord? Or are you running out of shadows and leaving substance behind? 
It shall make your robe remain white and clean, unstained, unspotted by the dirty pollutions of the world. It's only then the Lord Jesus Christ will confess you before the Father when you are walking worthy of the vocation where which you are called. And that final commendation of the Lord Jesus Christ will be the most important. Whatever commendation you have today from man, even from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, if you do not live an overcoming life, so you can have the final eternal commendation, all the commendation and the praise of today will be nothing. Present yourself before the Lord, that God will help you to be faithful to the very end. Faithful to the very end. Faithful to the very end. That your sign of the unchanging word of God and spiritual death will be cancelled out of your life and out of the congregation too, that your people of God that you are ministering to will stay alive. And at every time you'll be so faithful to bring messages that are appropriate to the need of your congregation. Rather than just preaching something you think might look exciting and interesting to people. Let the Lord know your heart. Let the Lord know your heart. The only thing that's important to you is the praise and the commendation of the Lord. The praise and the commendation of the Lord. As the Lord receives you and cleanses you with the blood of the Lamb, remain clean. Honor the continual flow of the blood of the Lamb so that when you will come, you will not be ashamed at the time you come.